to What You Will Learn. My name is Adam Ashton. And my name is Adam Jones. Today we're taking you through the best bits of Enlightenment Now by Steven Pinker, The Case for Reason, Science, Humanism and Progress. Pinker says how the bleak assessment of the state of the world is totally wrong. And he says not just like a little bit wrong, but he says it's wrong, wrong, flat earth wrong. He's saying that uh, this book presents a different understanding of the world grounded in fact, inspired by the ideals of the Enlightenment. Now, the Age of the Enlightenment was an intellectual and philosophical movement that dominated the world of ideas in Europe during the 17th and 18th centuries. The Enlightenment principle basically says we can apply reason and sympathy to enhance human flourishing. Might seem obvious, trite and old-fashioned, but um, he's wrote this book because it's no longer obvious how important these ideals really are. He says there's a lot of gifts that we take for granted. Newborns who will live more than five decades, markets overflowing with food, clean water that appears with a flick of a finger, waste disposal that appears with another flick of another finger, uh, pills that erase painful infection, sons who are not sent off to war, daughters who can walk the streets in relative safety, critics of the powerful who are not jailed or shot, the world's knowledge and culture available in a shirt pocket. But of course, these are all human accomplishments. They weren't cosmic birthrights. Absolutely. If you think about how you wake up, you pop the shower and all of a sudden this hot water just pops out. Um, And at some stage in history, that wasn't just a birthright that we were born with. Someone just solved all the problems of the infrastructure and understood the physics of generating hot water and everything like that. So, you know, you could say ingratitude is the, the norm for what some of these accomplishments have been in the past. Of course, at the same time, we've still got war, scarcity, disease, a lot of ignorance, a lot of menace, um, and these are just a natural part of existence. But countries, whilst we can slide back to more primitive conditions or primitive ways of thinking, we often tend to ignore those you know, 10 or 12 magnificent innovations that we just listed off that have around mm-hmm. today that uh, a few decades or a few centuries ago would have been a totally different world. 100%, man. And the ideals of the Enlightenment, they're products of human reason but they always struggle with other strands of human nature, which goes against reason. So things like loyalty to the tribe, deference to authority, magical thinking, or the blaming of misfortune on all the evildoers. When it comes to health, wealth, and inequality, we're living in the greatest period in history. Barack Obama said, if you had to choose a moment in history to be born and you didn't know ahead of time who you would be, You didn't know whether you're going to be born into a wealthy family, a poor family, what country you'd be born into, whether you're going to be a man or a woman. If you had to choose blindly what moment you'd be born, you'd choose now. And that was from the Big Barack. So in this episode, we're going to find out exactly why. So before we get into the ideas of health, wealth, and inequality and why today is the greatest time in human history to be living... Let's have a look at what reason is and also why some people are against this idea of reason and enlightenment. So, according to Immanuel Kant, so he was back in the the days of the enlightenment, he said um, the motto of the enlightenment is the dare to understand and in the pursuit to understand, the most important thing is reason. This is non-negotiable. So, as soon as you show up to discuss the question of what we should be living for on earth or any other question, as long as you insist that your answers, whatever they are, are reasonable or justified, or true, and that therefore people ought to believe them too. Then you have committed yourself to reason and to hold your beliefs accountable to some sort of objective standards. If there's anything the Enlightenment thinkers all had in common, uh, and regardless of where they came from or what field that they were working in, the thing that they had in common was their insistence to apply the standard of reason to understanding the world, and not to fall back on generators of delusion like faith, Dogma, revelation, authority, charisma, mysticism, divinity, visions, gut feelings, they were all underlying their their arguments with reason. It was a pretty big step up in the world because before the Enlightenment, that was probably just the normal way of going about things, just your faith and your dogma. And all of a sudden, this idea of reason popped up and the whole world changed pretty quickly. And with that was uh, around the time of Adam Smith, the idea of the positive sum game and really the first rational analysis of what prosperity is and how we can grow it. The starting point of this is not the question of how to distribute wealth to everybody around the world, but the prior question of actually how wealth comes to exist in the first place. Yeah, Adam Smith, he noticed that an abundance of useful stuff cannot be conjured into existence by a farmer or a craftsman working in isolation. It depends on a network of specialists 
each of whom learns how to make something as efficiently as possible and who combine and exchange the fruits of their ingenuity, skill, and labor. The famous example he talks about is making a pin. So the, in this pin, you know, one dude can make one pin. They take a little bit of metal. They straighten it out. They sharpen down the point. They put a little head on the top. And one person could probably make one pin each day. Mm. But then if you make a pin factory, you have a whole workshop, a bit of a production line where you've got one person, one worker whose specialty is straightening that wire, making it super, super straight. Then he passes it along. The next person, their job is just to cut it. Then the next person, their job is to sharpen it down that point. If you've got people who are specializing in each of those different areas, you can probably make like 5,000 pins a day. Mm. That's obviously a very specific example. I don't know how many pins you need in the world, but that's just one example of how different specializers can then combine their different skills to make everything more far more productive and everybody far better off. I was pretty impressed there, show with your understanding of uh, <laughs> pin making. We've got, no, we've got no detail here. I was, I was wondering where that would be, would be going. But the whole idea is like what Adam Smith in capitalism has allowed for us to do is just to specialize in different things. And it gets to the point where, you know, our specialization, it might not be clear what the, how to exchange that for barter for something else like you need, like your fruit on the table. All this is a way of saying that people aren't just going out there and giving out stuff just because they're great. You know, someone doesn't go hunt down a cow and chop it up to give it to everybody. They're doing it because they get something back in return. They've got, they're self-interested. They're benefiting themselves. They're trading away what they've got so that they can get something back in return. It's not just so that everybody gets a little bit of bread and a little bit of meat just because the baker and the butcher are uh, just legends who are giving everybody food, but mm. it's because they're getting something out of this exchange as well. Yeah. So through these mediums of exchange, it's definitely an absolute positive sum game where everyone wins and you don't need to have any compassion in it whatsoever. The quote from Smitty is, it's not from the benevolence of the butcher or the brewer or the baker that we expect our dinner, but from their own regard of their own self-interest. So here we're in a system where if you're by pursuing your own self-interest, you're making the world a much better place for everyone else who's also in society. And interestingly, this exchange all works and this whole system, this whole society holds up and gradually gets richer. Um, it's basically because the efficient market makes it cheaper to buy something than to steal something. Obviously, if, uh, if you've just got one person who's controlling all the cows and then you can go out there in the middle of the night and try and take a cow, it's a lot of hard work to try and steal a cow, chop up your own cow, make your own steaks. But if uh, through the efficient market, if everybody, if all the butchers are competing on price, it's going to become cheaper for you to then actually just buy the cow and contribute to society rather than steal it. Mm. So later in the episode, we'll, we'll show what the markets have been able to do to the world. But just for the moment, like who's against science? Who's against reason? And why? Like how how could you be against these sorts of things? The ideals they just seem unexceptional and self evident, and just something that uh, just so obvious that we should be pursuing. But what Stephen Pinker is saying, and really why he wrote the book, is because. All the institutions that are around the world, whether it be schools, hospitals, charities, new agencies, democratic governments, international organizations, the ideals of reasons for these organizations need defense because the trust around the world is sinking. He said that in the original Enlightenment uh, of the, the 17th and 18th century, after this Enlightenment, all this flourishing, all this growth, there was a pretty swift counter enlightenment where other you know opposing people came in and said well you've done all this stuff but maybe it's not good enough maybe there's actually a whole a different approach of doing it and he's saying that whilst you know this enlightenment now he's saying the 21st century version of the enlightenment there's also a counter enlightenment happening as well who people who don't agree with what's going on so there's a couple of forces in this counter enlightenment firstly it's faith and this is the obvious one that goes against reason sometimes because if you're taking something on faith it means you're believing it um, with no good reason behind it so by definition of a faith is the existence of supernatural entities and this whole idea clashes with reason. The second part of the counter-enlightenment is, is ideology. So that's a clan, a tribe, an ethnic group, a religion, a race, a class, a nation, some kind of ideological group where they bandy themselves together and pit themselves against enlightenment. It's a left and right issue. Right, Not so long ago, nationalism was fused with Marxist liberation movements on the left, but now nationalism is really a, a right-wing issue but on the other end many on the left are encouraging identity politicians and social justice warriors to downplay individual rights like looking to equalize races classes and genders um, which they see as zero-sum games in between each other rather than the positive sum games that we can have from the enlightenment 
Or another one is the romantic green movement that just sees how we're capturing energy around the world, not as a way of resisting entropy and benefiting and flourishing as a species and reducing and eliminating suffering, but as a heinous crime against nature um, and which we're going to pay for in dreadful justice in the forms of resource wars and poisoned air and water and the whole civilization blowing up in uh, climate change. So these different ideologies have almost become secular religions in themselves. They're providing people with a community of like-minded brethren. Um, it's sort of one form of you know pitting themselves against another. Science and reason is commonly being blamed for racism, imperialism, world wars, the Holocaust, and it's accused of robbing life of its enchantment and stripping humans of the freedom and dignity. So enlightened humanism, it's uh, far from being a crowd pleaser. Not many people are out there going to protect it except for Big the Pink Man who wrote this book. So, you know, saving the lives of billions, eradicating disease, feeding the hungry. These are kind of boring to a lot of people. No one's talking about this stuff. Or let's say people extending their compassion for all of humankind, not just those in your own country or own ethnic group. That's not good enough for people either. Okay, let's just hop in our time machine and go back to before the 20th century. Now, firstly, the cities were piled high in excrement. Think about today or this morning as you drop waste in the toilet. You press a button and it just magically vanishes. It wasn't the case back then. It somehow just appear um, somewhere in the surroundings. So, to rivers and lakes, they were viscous with waste. And your residents and your neighbor and yourself, you're drinking and washing your clothes in this same putrid brown liquid. And if you did get sick uh, and you went to the local doctors, they weren't necessarily out out to save you because they were also a major health hazard. They went from autopsy to examining rooms in these black coats that were encrusted with dry blood and pus. And they were probing the patient's wound and then hopping into your one and then probing your wounds with unwashed hands. (laughs) Yeah, it's, it's pretty disgusting. That was until there was progress in science and research Firstly, the epidemiologists, they found that the, in London, people who got cholera, turns out it wasn't just from the nasty air that was floating around that people initially thought that that's where they got sick from. Actually, it turns out they were getting their water, their drinking water was coming downstream from where the sewage was. So, mm. people were shitting out diseases, then you were drinking it in. And similarly, you've got a bloke named Ignaz Semmelweis. He found out that if you go from autopsy and you got all these dirty, dirty, you know, a dead person stuff on you and then you go and deliver a baby and then the mother and the baby both die because they've got some gross autopsy juices inside of them, then actually that's probably a bad idea. And he said, well, maybe we should wash our hands and sterilize our equipment first. So it was from these uh, this progress in science and research that they found, you know, how to make people healthier and not actually kill people. So all of a sudden... Blood transfusions allowed surgery to cure rather than torture and mutilate. You got antibiotics that pop up, antitoxins and countless other medical advances further beat back the assault. So today when we wake up, I think we're forgetting a lot of the times in our whole intellectual culture. We've got some kind of amnesia for all the conquerors of disease in the past. So as impressive as the conquest of infectious diseases in Europe and America was, the ongoing progress amongst the global poor is even more astonishing. Part of the explanation can be explained by the economic development because a richer world is a healthier world. Part of it lies in the expanding circle of sympathy. You've got you know, big leaders like Bill Gates who have made billions of dollars and who are now then trying to take their money that they've made from business to solve some of these big diseases like AIDS, malaria, all these big things where we're trying to support not just the richest countries but the poorest as well. So for most of human history, the strongest force against us of death was infectious disease. This is a nasty feature of evolution in which smaller organisms, they make their living at our expense and they hitch a ride from body to body in bugs and worms and these worms kind of just damage our body. We sneeze after it and then we pass the the disease on and uh, that's how these biological things kind of just keep their life sustained. So in in the early days, going back before the age of science and reason, we knew that these were a problem. We knew that there was all these things going on that people were getting sick and we had our own ways of fighting it. Things as prayer, sacrifice, bloodletting, cupping, having in, injecting toxic metals, homeopathy, squeezing a hen to death against the infected part of the body to try to draw the devil out of the body. They were obviously some things that tried and probably didn't work too well. 
And then it wasn't, in, <laughs> it wasn't until like the late 18th century when the Enlightenment period started coming that we had the invention of, of vaccines and new, more modern medical approaches to actually start to quell some of these diseases. So the struggle to stay alive and keep on kicking and not kicking the can, it's a primal urge of all of us human beings on the planet. And we really deploy a lot of our ingenuity and all of our life energy, I guess, to stave off death as long as possible. So how long do you think the average person's going to live today? Um, and this is including those who are going to have early death because of hunger and uh, those in developing countries. And quite remarkably, it's 71.4 years um, to live, which is uh, pretty exciting. We've got another 40 or so years to go, Ash. Yeah. There's been a pattern in life expectancy across human history. In the mid-18th century, in Europe and America, it was around... 35, 35 years was your life expectancy. And if you take the whole world average, it was like 29. And so we'd be done, mate. We'd be done. We'd be lucky already. Yeah. So that was really the range for most of human history. For literally thousands of years, that was the life expectancy. You know, it was somewhere around, you know, 29 to 35. For hunter gatherers, it was around 32 and a half years. But then in the 19th century, we embarked on this marvelous, what he calls the great escape. So with this great escape, we started getting on top of poverty, disease, and early death. So life expectancy, it began to rise and uh, really picked up speed in the 20th century and had no sign of slowing down, which is pretty astonishing, the, the changes we've had. We tend to think that we approach death by one year for every year we age. Obviously, if you get a year older, you get a year closer to death. But throughout the 20th century, it actually had a weird uh, mathematical statistical thing that every time you got a year older, you actually only got seven months closer to death and that's because that that uh expected that life expectancy kept getting older and older and older so even though you were getting older you had a few more years up the sleeve as well got a good one we've got some kenyan listeners i've looked at our download so we do have a whole bunch of people in kenya listening which is great um if you're from kenya you got some pretty exciting data here because between 2003 and 2013 um which is 10 years you got zero years closer to death <laughs> because the improvements there because uh, the life expectancy rose by 10 years in that same time period. It doesn't matter how much you lived and you struggled in that full decade, you actually didn't get a single year closer to death. Yeah, there's, there's, probably, there's obviously a statistical thing there. Maybe if you're, ten, you're feeling a bit 10 years older, maybe your knee's a bit sore, maybe you're waking up a bit groggy in the mornings. But as it turns out, statistically, even though 10 years have gone past, the life expectancy increased by 10 years, which is, uh, which is pretty incredible over, the, over a short span of 10 years. Um, the average lifespans, of course, are stretched the most by things like infant and child mortality. Obviously, purely statistical, if you've got a whole bunch of people living to 70 and then you throw a zero or a one in there, that's going to drag that life expectancy down a lot. So, something like uh, improving infant and child mortality rates is going to drastically improve the overall life expectancy. Yeah, so child mortality has gone from 18% down to 4%, still too high, but sure to come down still. Um I think back to Hans Rosling in Factfulness, he's got the idea of uh, things can be better and bad. So even though mm. things are getting much, much better over time, it still can be bad. And we've got this cognitive uh, difficulty to hold these two things in the brain at the same time. That's right. You can look at 4% and say that's still way too high. But if you look at it and it used to be 18%, it's still, that's a lot better. Mm. And this, this, mate, we're just talking about statistics here. Like it just seems like we're just throwing out numbers. But if you think about the human turmoil of what child mortality is, Right, like you got it's a devastating experience for a person. So, the amount of misery that you're putting in someone's life at an 18% rate um, for all the mothers and the family members who are close to it, it's just a huge benefit that just goes beyond just plain numbers on a page. Now, repeat that just millions and millions and millions of times, which we've er the suffering we've eradicated from the improvements and progress we've had. And that's just not the babies and the infant mortality. Um, until recently, 1% of mothers died in pregnancy and now that's essentially gone to zero. So, you might be thinking that the reduction in infant and child mortality, obviously, that's going to have a massive impact on the average life expectancy, but that's not the only gains as well. So, not only have we reduced infant and child mortality so drastically, which has helped the average life expectancy numbers, but no matter how old you are, you're actually your life expectancy has improved as well. Say a 30-year-old 
in 1845, if you had made it through childhood, which is obviously a very risky time, if you got to 30 years of age, then you could look forward to roughly another 33 years still to come. So that was in 1845. In 1905, a 30-year-old could expect to live for another 36 years. In 1955, a 30-year-old could expect to live for 45 years. And in 2011, a 30-year-old could expect to live for 52 years. So we're going from uh, an average life expectancy remaining of 33 all the way up to 52 additional years in the space of one and a half centuries. So life expectancies is something that is huge that has happened in the past where we've got the Enlightenment thinkers to, to really thank for. Another really big one is, is food. Um, we're no longer hungry and we're getting nutritious food. Chris Rock, the great philosopher, he once observed, <laughs> this is the first society in history where the poor people are fat. Yeah, normally it's the poor people who are who can't get enough food, but now it's the poor people who are eating the maccas and the really cheap but high calorie food that they're some of the cheapest food is some of the worst for you. Yeah, well it's a it's a public health problem how fat a lot of the world is really getting from all these bad foods, but if you compare it to uh poverty and starvation and dying that way, in the relative sense it doesn't even compare to what to what that is. In recent times, the world has been blessed with another remarkable and little-noticed advance, and that's that in spite of burgeoning numbers, the developing world is actually feeding itself. You've got 1.3 billion people in China who've got access to an average of 3,000 calories per day, plus a billion people in India who are getting an average of 2,500 calories per day. So it reflects an increase in the availability of calories throughout the whole entire range, including the very bottom of the world. Um, which is a big deal because when children are underfed like they all used to be in the developing countries, their growth is stunted and throughout their lives they have a higher risk of getting sick and dying. So, for example, through the um, proportion of stunted children in countries like Kenya and Bangladesh, it's not a good thing, it's a bad thing. But in just two decades, the rate of stunting has been cut in half. Now, that's not to say that the problem has been solved. There's still hunger. There's still famines. Even in the last decade, you've, you've had famines in East Africa in 2011 and 2012. You've had famines in South Sudan in 2016, um, together with other close to famines, but not technically famines in Somalia, Nigeria, Yemen. But they didn't kill the same number of people like uh, at, at anywhere near the scale of these similar catastrophes would have centuries earlier. So as we said, it's bad that there's still famines like this and there are still places in the world that aren't getting fed properly, but it is better than it used to be. So what the hell has happened to make all these improvements? And of course, it comes down to agriculture because recently it can grow exponentially uh, one piece of land that can grow more and more abundance when knowledge is applied to increase the amount of food that can be coaxed from just the one unit of land. So let's zoom back again in a time machine, this time to the agriculture of what it was 10,000 years ago. Um, we started genetically engineering plants and animals back then by selectively breeding the ones that had the most calories and was easiest to plant, had the fewest toxins. So accidentally, we domesticated these things. And this was the first iteration of unconscious uh, genetic engineering of our food. You had a grass with a few tough seeds that over time became a nice juicy corn. You had like a little dandelion root that over decades of or centuries of cultivation became a nice juicy carrot. Also, the ancestors of many wild fruits were a little bitter, astringent, mostly just stone with a tiny bit of flesh that over time became much more tasty. Uh, in addition to the selection of the types of plants, clever farmers also tinkered around with irrigation, plows, organic fertilizers. All of these things led to a greater production of food supplies. So yields per hectare have grown exponentially as our genetically engineering techniques to, to get yield from the land has also improved. Let's zoom back to 1901. It's actually not that long ago by our his, history standards. But let's say you put an hour's work in for the day. What you get back is about a litre of milk. Not a hell of a lot for hard hours work. But today, one hour can think about what it can get you. A pound of butter, 12 dozen eggs, two pounds of pork chops to five pounds or nine pounds of flour and maybe a movie ticket to go with it depending on what your job is. So the difference in what one hour of your time gets you today, it's uh, uncomparable. There's a great stat here that's saying between 1961 to 2009, so this is like you know the most recent you know, five decades or so, the amount of land across the planet that was used to grow food actually increased by 12%, but the amount of food that was grown on that land increased by 300%. 
So in addition to beating back hunger, the ability to grow more food from less land has been on the whole a good thing for the planet. Oh, absolutely, man. If, if we had the same productivity as we did back then, essentially the whole world would be uh, farms to, to try and yeah. feed the population. But luckily, we don't have to do that. But um, like all advances and, the, and those who are against these reason and the enlightenment, the Green Revolution and as amazing as it's been at feeding the population and feeding people, particularly in the developing countries, people are right against it, aren't they? Well, there's, there's plenty of reasons to be against it. You know, high-tech agriculture, the critics say that it consumes fossil fuels and groundwater, it uses herbicides, pesticides, it disrupts traditional subsistence agriculture, it's biologically unnatural, and it just generates profits for these big, greedy corporations. That's obviously a whole bunch of arguments against it. Yeah, well, you hear that all the time. I've probably been some, one of the people sprouting those ones and throwing those lines at people, but... Like, if we're going to say that, we've got to compare it to, say, a billion lives saved from the major famines that didn't happen and they're in the mm. dustbin of history. And if you compare it to that, a billion lives, maybe it's a bit of a reasonable price to pay. So, traditional environmentalist groups like that and like I was, there's somewhat of a customary indifference to the starvation um, that's been avoided. So, in terms of health and life expectancy, there's never, ever been a better time to be alive today. Now, the sin of ingratitude, it didn't really come up in the top seven, but um, maybe it should have. In a world governed by entropy and evolution, the streets, unfortunately, they're not paved with pastry. Cooked fish do not land at our feet, unfortunately. But it's easy to forget this truism and to think that wealth and prosperity has kind of always been with us. Yeah, it just didn't just pop up. There's a great economist that we all know and love, Peter Bauer, Um, He said, poverty has no causes, wealth has causes. And another economist who we also love, Nathan Rosenberg, he also pointed out, we are led to forget the dominating misery of other times in part by the grace, literature, poetry, romance, and legend, which celebrate those who lived well and forget those who lived in the silence of poverty. The eras of misery have been mythologized and may even be remembered as golden ages of pastoral simplicity. They were not. Says, you know, we always hear that history was written by the winners, but what uh, Pinker says is probably more accurate is actually that history was was written by the affluent because this was the small slither of humanity that had the leisure, the free time, and the education to write about it. So we're hearing about history through the lens of the the rich and educated people, and that's probably why everything sounds pretty rosy. One thing we don't hear a lot of is that in pre-industrial Europe, the purchase of a garment or the purchase of cloth to make a garment was an absolute luxury that the common people couldn't afford and or they could only afford maybe a couple of times throughout their life. And they said that one big occupation of hospital administrators was to ensure that the clothes of deceased people don't get usurped, that they should actually be given to their lawful inheritors, the next of kin, and things like during the epidemics of plagues, people would be roaming the streets, looking for people who would drop dead in the streets to just pinch their clothes. So the police had to go out there and, and burn the dead and burn the clothes, which probably were riddled with the, the diseases from the plague that you probably wouldn't want to wear their clothes anyway. 100%. Yeah, the person who's rummaging through the dead person's clothes on the street, they're not getting back to just write the book about what <laughs> happened in history and we're reading today. They they kind of get silence. It's the 1% uh, who you hear from and it sounds, does sound pretty rosy. So, it's, this is a bit of a fallacy and it's because we don't hear about the losers of history, um, we're led to believe today that wealth is a given and it was always like this. The story of the growth of prosperity was similar to the growth in life expectancy. You know, we had that average life expectancy of around 30 years for pretty much forever until the great escape and things just went boom. The story of prosperity is pretty similar as well. Nothing, nothing, nothing. Repeat nothingness for a few thousand years and then boom. So, let's say you were born in the time of Jesus and then popped up a thousand years later. Um, it's pretty much nothing going on. You're about the same in terms of wealth. So, it's a long time, long generations of just nothingness. And it took about another half millennia after that. So, we're at 1500 AD. It doubled. So, the rate of doubling was 500 years. But then it just went bang in uh, a few centuries after that. So, between 1820 and 1900, the world's income tripled. And then 50 years later, it tripled again. It then took only 25 years to triple again. And then 31 years later, it tripled again. So, it's just gone on this exponential boom. So, we've gone up almost 200x since the start of the Enlightenment 
in the 18th century. So that's after, as you say, a thousand years of nothing and then 500 years it took to double. Now, it's only taken a couple hundred years to then go 200x. Mm. So if we're debating today what, about economics, a lot of the debates are around economic distribution and how we cut the pie. But if we had this discussion back then and we only worried about cutting the pie, we'd be cutting the pie the size of a five cent coin. Um, but if we let them just worry about growing a larger pie where everyone can have a bigger slice, things would be much different because the pie we were dividing in the year 1700 was baked on a nine-inch pan, pretty tiny. And today, it would be about 10 feet in diameter by comparison. So really, the only way that we can look to compare a dollar in 1800 to a dollar in 2000 is to look at how many bucks you'd have to fork over to buy what economists call this standard basket of goods. So, you know, this fixed amount of food, clothing, healthcare, fuel, so on. That's sort of how we calculate inflation. But whilst that gives you, I guess, a, a, a plain, boring, statistical way to look at growth of income and GDP and things like that, it doesn't really paint the full picture. Because yes, you can look at how much a slice of bread costs today versus a slice of bread 200 years ago, but we're not then factoring in the wild new cool shit that technology has brought with it. No matter how much money you had back in 1800, you couldn't buy a refrigerator, you couldn't buy musical recordings, a bicycle, a mobile phone, couldn't look up Wikipedia, you couldn't have photos of your kids, you couldn't have a laptop and a printer, you couldn't have a contraceptive pill or doses of antibiotics. The, really, it didn't matter how much money you had, there's so many things around today that you couldn't have bought 200 years ago. Yeah, if we went up to King Henry in the 17th century, who's, who's got his son dying of some sort of disease and you've you got antibiotics in your hand, like how much does that cost? And <laughs> probably to King Henry at the time, it costs all the money in the world. And this is something we've got now that King Henry couldn't even dream of back then. King Henry's son, I don't know anything about sure, King Henry. I'm sure he died. I'm sure he died. <laughs> his luck. son died or something. <laughs> Because after 1750, the base of new technology, it all went, also went through the same big boom. Um, so not only new products and technologies emerged, it became better understood why and how the old ones worked. So things were refined, debugged, improved, and combined in novel ways to adaptive uses. So it's towed around all the time. The iPhone we've got in our pocket today, it's computationally more powerful than NASA had to send um, astronauts into the moon and well, that's only 50 years ago and uh, we can see the exponential growth in technology that we've got to got to live with there's a wild stat he's got here which i've as you were talking i was trying to work out this stat you're saying that in 2008 the average world population of a single person of all you know seven billion people in the world you average all their incomes that income is greater than the entire western europe put together 50 years ago Whew. that's a wild stat it's not bad, is it? And the skeptic, and you might think, or oh, the cynic, it's just because, oh, yeah, of course, it's just the rich are getting richer. It's because Musk and Bezos, they're kicking ass and they're getting all the money. But it's really at the other end, just as much, maybe even more. Extreme poverty, it's being eradicated, and the world is just in general moving up to middle class. So, in the space of 200 years, the rate of extreme poverty in the world has gone from 90%. So, if you just popped up, there's a 9 out of 10 chance you're going to be in extreme poverty, hunger, and everything like that. Today, it's 10%. And the majority of that decline has only been in the last few decades. So, the point of calling attention to all this progress is not meant to just, you know, for everyone to be like, yeah, good job, we're, we're pretty happy today. It's really to identify the causes to see what happened over the last two centuries that really took us to 200x growth in terms of income plus this technological boom. If we can identify the causes, maybe we can do a bit more of it to keep growing and keep improving the welfare of those at the bottom. One of the big things that's worked and caused this progress is actually the decline of communism with the same thing with intrusive socialism. So for reasons we've kind of touched upon, market economies can generate wealth just at a wild, wild rate. Whilst those uh, totalitarian planned economies, they impose scarcity, stagnation, and a lot of the time famine and the suffering that comes from that. Market economies, in addition to reaping the benefits of specialization and providing incentives for the people to produce things that other people want, they solve the problem of coordinating the effort of hundreds of millions of people by using prices to propagate information about need and availability far and wide. So it's pretty clear if you popped up on Richard Branson's uh, space, new space venture thing and you get out in space and you fly over Korea where it's pretty well distinguished between North Korea, which is under um, Astro's mate Kim Jong, is it Kim Jong-un? 
I think it's Un at the moment. Yeah, mm, yeah, yeah. Well, communists anyway. In the south, you got South Korea, which is a market economy and capitalist. At night time, you'll see the communist north, just a big pit of darkness where they can't afford or have electricity. And just below it in the south, you've got lights and activity flowing everywhere. Not much different if you compare West and East Germany, Botswana versus Zimbabwe, and Chile versus Venezuela. But isn't it all going to the rich? That's probably a natural question a lot of us in developed countries are asking today. I mean, economic inequality has become a bit of an obsession. Barack Obama, again, he called it the defining challenge of our time. Between 2009 and 2016, the proportion of articles in the New York Times that contained the word inequality, it soared tenfold, reaching 1 in 73. That's bizarre, man. There's a lot of words out there. Ratio of 1 in 73 is the word inequality is insane. <laughs> I don't think it was 1 in 73 words are inequality. You're saying 1 in 73 articles had the word inequality in it. But still, going up <laughs> tenfold in seven years, obviously, it's, a, it's becoming a new absolute focus, isn't it, over that short stretch of time. So, let's just hop in now, conventional wisdom. It says that, let's say, the, rich, the richest 1%, they've just skinned off all the economic growth of recent decades and everyone else is just treading water or just slowly sinking compared to them. So, if the explosion of wealth that we've just detailed in the previous section, it's not, not really worth celebrating because all the other big dogs are just taking it on themselves. Yeah, that would be pretty lame if we're saying that the world's got 200x richer over the last 200 years, but all the money just went to Big Elon getting 200x of that slice of the pie. That would be that's a pretty lame story. What's a much better story is the true story that's happened out there is that it's not looking so much at inequality, but more about poverty and how can we reduce poverty. So the starting point for understanding inequality is a context of human progress is to recognize it. Income inequality is not a fundamental component of well-being. It's not like health, prosperity, knowledge, safety, peace, all of those things are components of well-being, of course, whereas income inequality, you being not quite so rich as some of the richest people, that's not really part of well-being. It's captured in an old joke from the old Soviet Union. You got Igor and Boris, they're both dirt poor peasants. And they're barely just scratching enough crops for their small plots of land to feed their families. There's only one difference between them, and that's Boris. He owns a scrawny goat. Now, one day, a fairy appears to Igor and grants him one wish. Igor says, I wish that Boris's goat should die. <laughs> so, obviously, uh, Igor wasn't thinking too big there. He probably could have had a better wish. But both those two peasants, they've become a lot more equal now. So, income inequality between Boris and Igor has just gone to zero but neither of them is better off. Yeah, 100%. So what's objectionable here is poverty, right? Like They should be finding ways to make sure we're eliminating poverty between the two. If we're just looking at inequality only um, without looking at poverty, then both of them are much worse off. Yeah, that's the, the big point there is that inequality itself is not morally objectionable. What is definitely objectionable is poverty. If you're living a long, pleasurable and simulating life free of suffering and you're just enjoying your time, it shouldn't really matter too much how much the Joneses earn or the person driving the Lamborghini up the street and how big their house is or how many cars they have in the drive. All these things are morally irrelevant. What is morally important is that each person that we know should have enough, and this is what we should be striving for. That's right. We shouldn't be driving around Melbourne thinking, oh, all these people in their big Turak mansions, I wish they'd burn down. That's like the equivalent of killing Boris's goat rather than thinking, how can we get a goat of our own? Instead of uh, us complaining about our position, we should be looking to the people who don't have a home at all and thinking, how can they get one to, to get rid of the, the poverty and bring everybody up to just that base level of need of having exactly enough or having what they need to have. So we kind of touched on the bit of the fallacy of what's going on here. I think a lot of people who are striving for distribution um, changes and stopping inequality, there's this underlying belief that the market and the world operates in a zero-sum fashion. But wealth, as we saw, it's not like that. It's a positive sum game. And since the Industrial Revolution, the all boats are rising as the ocean rises. And this doesn't mean just the rich are getting richer. It means that the poorer can get richer too. So the purely market-based capitalist approach, their statistics they're looking at is maximizing the average of the market economy. But what we also really do need to care about is looking at that variance and the range as well. So we can't just increase the average by increasing the top. 
we need to decrease the range or decrease the variance by pulling up the bottom as well. So yeah, we're not just saying capitalism is the only answer and increasing the average is all that matters and it doesn't really matter about the variance. So social spending to improve those who are much worse off is really important. But at a point, it becomes um, much closer to the communism, which we were talking about earlier. So at around about 25% of social spending, there's a lot of upside, which starts to get lost beyond that point. Inequality statistics that we point to can paint a bit of a misleading picture about the state of the world. Things like technology and globalization have actually transformed what it means to be a poor person, at least in a developing country, because we need to know the difference between absolute prosperity and relative prosperity. So today, the poor are likely to be just as overweight as their employers and you dress in the same fleece, sneakers and the same jeans. Um, The poor used to be called the have-nots, but... In 2011, more than 95% of American households below the poverty line had electricity, running water, they could flush toilets, they had a refrigerator, they had a stove, a color TV, and it was only a century and a half before where the Rothschilds, the Astors, and the Vanderbilts, obviously the richest people in the world back then, they had none of these things the poorest people in the developed countries have today. To go a step further, almost half of the households Below the poverty line in the US have got a dishwasher, 60% have a computer, two-thirds have a washing machine and a dryer, and more than 80% have an air conditioner, a video recorder, and a mobile phone. So 30 years ago, which a lot of us idolize as the golden age of equality, the middle class haves had few or none of these things. And as a result, the most precious resource of all for all of us is time, freedom, and worthy experience. These are also rising across the board. The rich have gotten richer, but their lives haven't really got that much better. There's uh, not a whole lot more you can do. Once you've got to the top of the top and you can have anything you want, adding an extra billion or two on top doesn't really change your life all that much, I'm sure. Yeah, 100%. Warren Buffett, he may not have more air conditioners than most people or even better ones, but by historical standards, the fact that the majority of Americans or Australians or those in the developed world have air conditioners, it's astonishing. So inequality, we need to know, is not the same as poverty. It's not a fundamental dimension of human flourishing that everybody should be equal, but what we should be saying is that we want to reduce poverty by as much as possible. So we've thrown a whole bunch of statistics at you. We spoke about how wealth, health, and inequality have actually all improved significantly, especially over the last couple of decades and the last couple of centuries. The lives that we're living today are just so different and so much better than the lives that people were living 200 years ago. But why is it that people aren't seeing this? Or why is it that people are opposing reason and progress and all the good things that have happened? Yeah, there's all sorts of biases you can pull from. One is motivational reasoning, where you're directing an argument before towards your favorite conclusion rather than following where it leads. So let's say you want to whip out a victim narrative about where you are in the world or house prices are too high, it's not like it used to be for our parents. That's a pretty common one in Melbourne. So if you've got that narrative, you're probably going to turn a blind eye to all the other ways that how much richer you were for Hmm. those a generation before. Another big one is this idea of blue lies. So we all know what a white lie is. Um, Often the white lie is, you know, these jeans look good on me and of course they always look fantastic Uh, that could be a little bit of a white lie the white lie of just not saying something keeping something to yourself for what you think is the greater good you've obviously got your full lies which everyone knows what a full lie is is just completely saying something that's a lie then you've got the blue lie which is something a little bit different and a blue lie is told for the benefit of an in group so I might be stepping over a few landmines here, but um, let's say you've got the romantic green movement, for example, where uh, you're against um, economic progress and it's just demolishing the planet and you're in that group, you're probably not going to be well accepted to the whole group if you're just talking about all the, the progress that we've had through you know, coal and all these sorts of things that have um, done for the world and what it's doing for the developing countries. You're probably not going to be popular in that group you're probably not going to be able to see both sides. You're just probably just going to be spouting the one story just for acceptance. So Stephen Pinker's final call, his final call for reason, he says that we should be making reason the currency of our discourse. It's all about uh, clarity, looking at data, looking at science and looking at reason for the lens through which we see the world. So maybe we can start being a lot more grateful about the time we live today compared to what it was in history. 
So human history, it's filled with this big backdrop of progress and things getting better. And you're just at this tip of this point of, of, of where it's been. So when it comes to health, wealth and inequality and a lot of other things, we're no doubt living in the greatest period in history. Want the can't stop, won't stop watching sort of stuff? You know, the dramatic stuff. AMC Plus has it all. Would you go to war for your family? Don't miss Kin, the all-new Irish gangland drama. Ready to raise the stakes? Catch up on the latest episodes of The Walking Dead's epic final season. Nostalgic for TV's golden age? AMC Plus is the home of Mad Men. Plus, meet a sitcom wife like no other, and Kevin can F himself, starring Annie Murphy. Available ad-free, on demand, and on the platforms you're already on. Sign up today at amcplus.com. AMC Plus, only the good stuff.